Just waiting, just waiting. But now I think we can begin. Hi, everybody. My name is Renee Hobbs, and welcome to the final session of Media Logs on Propaganda. We are so delighted that you're here for this final showcase celebration. Um, we only have one hour together and we have a lot of amazing stories to tell. So let's get started, shall we? I'm sharing my screen with you and I'm inviting you to um, realize that, oh, let's just check and see if that, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen now. I hope you can. Um, this online professional learning community is designed to advance the quality of media literacy education by developing the knowledge, confidence, and leadership skills of German, American, and global teachers and teacher educators. We offer our sincere thanks to the U US Embassy in Berlin for supporting this project, which we've been developing throughout the academic year 2021-2022. At our main site, medialogs.de, you'll be able to access the Google Slides for this session because you're going to be inspired by the many amazing, by the many amazing creative contributions of participants here. Um, we thought it would be good for us to reflect a little bit on our journey. Uh, Troy, how did this program work in the fall semester? Yes, thanks, Renee. Um, just so you know, we can see the top part of your screen, but the whole screen for some reason is not showing. So you might want to just uh, stop share and reshare again with the with the slide deck. Thank so, you, thank you, thank you, Troy. Yeah, no problem. So, yep, in the fall, we were able to launch with five different webinars uh, led by a variety of um, guest speakers and experts from around the globe. Um, one of them, yours truly, thank you very much. Um, and we were able to do these one hour webinars that introduce the broad topics related to media literacy and propaganda and thinking about uh, what it means to teach media literacy in our modern age. And then that led to the events from this spring. And I think Silka is gonna talk a little bit more about those. Yes, um, in the spring, we explored uh, the power of two or more as a creative form of collaboration. So in our first session in January, participants found a partner or a team. And starting from a problem of practice, the teams developed a shared vision and started creating a structure and the process of their collaborative work. And in the session in February, we explored how powerful it can be to generate as many questions as possible about a propaganda artifact and reflect on the generated questions. In our session, Propaganda in Wartime in March, we reflected on how we experience propaganda in wartime, and we explored a powerful classroom activity to interpret war propaganda using a gem board. And during these two sessions, the teams were able to develop further and implement their own projects in a second round of breakout sessions. And today, here we are to share what we've learned during this exciting journey. Woohoo! Uh, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, what am I doing wrong here? There we go. Um, uh, Christina, you're going to lead us through the showcase experience. Can you talk a little bit about yeah, uh, of course. showcasing um, participants? Sure, if you could um, move us to the next slide, Renee, um, um, then, then I can do that. Um, I mean, um, the, the, the projects that she developed were already mentioned in the uh, Power of Two phase. Um, and um, in the last two we uh, in the last few weeks, um, you have been working on our um, shared media logs uh, Moodle platform together using uh, synchronous and asynchronous communication. And um, especially lately, um, uh, so many of our teams have been uh, very, very busy creating um, um, the, their uh, final presentations of their projects. And to, um, to aid uh, you with that, we have um, provided you uh, with, uh, with four um, guiding questions to showcase your projects, which was, um, we asked you um, to introduce um, the members of your team. Um, tell us a little bit about the 
topics or issues that you explored together. Um, uh, she invited you to share um, some thoughts um, about your collaboration experience and also your learnings. Could we go to the next slide maybe, um, Rene? I still see the um, community, uh, the, the webinar slide. Hmm. Maybe you want to share again. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so here we are, that's perfect. And now I'm inviting um, all of our teams um, to, uh, to uh, tell us um, about their experience, their project. I'm inviting April and Randall to start. And in case you haven't spotted the little tricky device in the, um, in the uh, lower right corner, that, uh, that is important for all the teams since so many uh, teams will share their um, their ideas and results. We had to uh, uh, impose time restrictions, so every team gets to speak for three minutes. Um, you have a timer um, so that you can t keep track yourselves. Um, and um, uh, Troy, I believe you're going to start the timers and. Um, uh, yeah, let's... yeah, actually, Renee will have to click the play button there on that YouTube video. And then also, Renee, from a technical angle, if you could just unpin us so the speakers that take over in just a few moments will be able to go. So it's going to be Good. fast and uh, you're going to have three minutes and uh, then we'll politely interrupt you <laughs> if it takes a little more than three minutes. <laughs> But uh, we, we hope you see your name and that you're ready to go. We'll try to give you a cue as to who's going to get ready to go next. So April and Randall, are you ready to take it away? Hmm. Sure. Um, I, I, hello, everyone. This is very exciting. I'm going to just provide a, a bit of an overview. And then Randall will be able to give a bit more of the nuts and the bolts. I did put in some hyperlinks there if you uh, would care to get uh, a little more in depth about the project that we have embarked upon and uh, for which uh, I wrote a grant in order for us to use Randall software to uh, have Minecraft team building activities uh, that uh, English language learners and other students will build uh, for example, we could have uh, a story would be uh, about contaminated drinking water would be presented from several different points of view. Uh, students could go look on Instagram, information from a water company, an independent news so source. We could look at Ad Fontes to determine uh, reliability and maybe a water testing company. The students would then build a water fountain in Minecraft with a pop pipeline to the water source, incorporating a solution such as a water filter. And then assessment will be based on a rubric co-designed with students to evaluate their 3D, 3D and the final video student product uh, in which they explain their issue, what they've read and watched and um, how this information led them to creating their Minecraft response. In the meantime, in the background, the software will examine uh, five points of social emotional learning and uh, that the students are gaining through this process. Randall? Yep, great. Thanks, April. Uh, feels like an escape room. We have a couple, <laughs> couple seconds left. Um, yeah, you explained it very well. Uh, basically, we're using Minecraft to uh, help students be engaged, number one, to, uh, to build together as teams, and then using that as... Uh, as their reflection and assessment. Um, and and uh, we can create videos in Minecraft to use as assessment. So it's a, it's a fun learning experience. The SEL component is from this uh, platform called WeThink. It, uh, it helps uh, kids develop SEL and soft skills just through uh, team, any team-based activities such as Minecraft building. So it's, it's just a feedback and a, a, a feedback um, platform that, that shows kids where they are in different measures of social and emotional learning at any time and helps them develop these skills. Are we under and time? You, you, you're, you're perfect. See? I, I was looking at my clock. Sharp. And, and I mean, uh, um, 
Yeah, thank, thank you, April and Randall. And I mean, um, there's always the opportunity to, to connect with teams uh, at a later point in time. So uh, let's move on to the second um, team, which is um, Bob, uh, Randall, Iglika, and Yanis. I'm making notes in my little notebook about questions I want to ask. Thank, Thank you. you team. The floor is ours. <laughs> um, here is our slide deck and the topic of our project about fear-based thinking, social emotional learning and media literacy, a classroom game. I'm giving the word and the floor to Bob. Hey, well, Randall and I met first and he described video games as the ultimate learning media. They're engaging, fun, get everybody involved and provide immediate feedback. I talked about how fear shrinks our frames and narrows our focus and how it could be replicated in a game in real time. And then Aglika and, and Giannis joined us, Aglika with her experience in media literacy and learning through video games and Giannis with propaganda and teacher education. And we became the power of four. So we designed a, designed a structure for a video game that helps students experience the effects of fear and fear-based thinking on perception while learning to analyze propaganda and develop skills in critical thinking and social emotional learning. Uh, the game allows for teacher input and measures progress while providing data for research. We plan to develop, implement, and test the game and make it available for classroom use. Uh, the, the objectives basically are the students will understand how fear and fear-based thinking limit their perception and how media literacy, critical thinking, and social emotional learning expand and deepen their capacity for effective decision making. Now, fear-based thinking is a state of mind that becomes deeply ingrained through prolonged fear or repeated message of, messages of fear. It restricts what we're willing and able to see as well as how we think and react. Fear-based thinking puts everything into broad fixed categories. It feeds a scarcity mentality and leads us to respond to perceived threats with power and control. It also makes us more self-centered, which blocks empathy and compassion. You could compare it to, to brain pathways actually. Uh, looking at it in terms of roads. If you're driving on a local road, it's pretty easy to change direction or go another way. Introducing fear is like paving the road. Everything's going faster, but you can still slow down and go in a different direction. Fear-based thinking is like a limited access highway. You're going at high speed, but you can only get on and off at predefined exits. Entrenched fear-based thinking is like railroad tracks. What you see and how you think is fixed by well-entrenched mental and emotional habits. We use three action principles to help us deal with, to help students feel with, deal with fear-based thinking in ourselves and others. I call them the ABCs, accept, balance, and clarify. Uh, I've been using them since the mid 1980s for training in, in stress management, psychotherapy, empowerment, communication, problem solving skills, and conflict resolution. And they're essentially a process of self-awareness and self-management that develop social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making by removing obstacles to seeing, feeling, and thinking clearly. Aglika? I guess that all that was said about peer-based thinking and the ABC agency resonates very well with understanding how media literacy empower people from every age to understand the effects, to control their reactions, and to resist different ways influencing our heart, hearts and minds. So these frameworks of the fear-based thinking and ABC agency and media literacy skills during our weekly discussions, we understand how well they resonate and complement each other. Well, Randall? Uh, unmute, please. Okay, thanks. Uh Christina, are, are we out of time? I think we're- You are out of time. Take your maybe, time. Maybe. <laughs> go ahead, <laughs> say more. Okay, I'll, I'll just go for like 30 seconds or more. Okay, so thank you for the, uh, thank you for stopping the music. Uh, so, so we've met uh, several times talking about how we can put together uh, a media literacy uh, based game uh, to, to uh, tackle fear-based thinking and, and encourage ABCs. And so our idea is to have a team-based competition where you're competing in the beginning, but in the end, the teams end up collaborating. So it's a more cooperative game. 
um, where we talked about different scenarios we could use, narratives we could use, um, and want to make it flexible enough so that uh, educators can swap out scenarios depending on what, what uh, who their class demographics are, what they're interested in. And then always using media, different types of different formats of media to make decisions for teams to make, to meet, reflect, make decisions. And then giving feedback on player dashboards and also having a teacher dashboard to see where, where uh, everybody is in terms of their fear-based thinking as an individual or as a team, how, how, how well they're doing. And then how well they're doing on media literacy skills too. Um, so the teacher can step in anytime and, and, and introduce more things or, or have a lesson about something. Um, we wanted to build an ample reflection opportunities because uh, a tenant in game-based learning is that you don't just play the game, you have to build in these reflection periods and that's where a lot of the learning comes in. And then I talked about flexible design. So um, there you go. Oh, 45 seconds, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so please let me uh, summarize the rest of it in like 30 seconds left. Uh, so the contemporary events that are happening in the middle of Europe uh, show that disinformation and propaganda, as well as fear-based states of mind, are inescapable. And we realize that it's part of our reality that people are vulnerable to the influences of disinformation and propaganda. So um, that it is also part of our reality that people develop fear, which influences how they think and react. And that's why we plan to design and develop a video game prototype based on the principles and theories of game-based learning, fear-based thinking, and media literacy. And we see a lot of potential in our goals and see a distinct need for our research. So we share the opinion that education alone cannot erase the fear that leads people to become vulnerable to false but emotionally resonant messages, but we also believe there are effective and innovative ways to promote democracy through developing educational approaches that bring truth to fear at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, the power of four. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, okay, if we um, move on um, with our um, regular slide deck, I believe it is then Philip and Ashkuma who are already waiting to share. Are you there and uh, ready to go? Yes, we are. Ashkuma, if you are ready, can I uh, uh, share my screen? Yeah. All right, we see your screen. So, uh, Philip I can, and I uh, connected, and uh, we sort of over conversations, uh, he wanted to build a, a lesson plan on propaganda for the ninth grade students. And uh, it was largely to be done through role models, uh, which was already something that was happening uh, in the classroom itself. So we wanted to extend that. Uh, so that was the basic premise of our lesson plan. And uh, Philip will take you through the classroom activities that we did. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. As already mentioned, I'm a middle school teacher in the Würzburg area. And we try to work on the topic of media literacy in terms of role models. We first of all talked about role models in general and um, how dangerous it might be to copy certain activities or behavior of role models. And then we asked our students um, to think about role models and their behavior in general and especially in the terms of social media. We then prepared um, different pictures and media artifacts which we wanted the students to discuss and to analyze. And Ashkumar, maybe you can open the class discussion very quickly. I'll have to, uh, it's not clickable. Do, do you have the pictures at hand? Yes, just a sec, I'll share. Can we stop the time in the meanwhile? Right. So these are the artifacts uh, that we created. So a lot of influencers, uh, each group had uh, different artifacts and there were certain questions that we uh, posed them to discuss. So I'll just scroll down on uh, the artifacts. So the artifacts were all taken from uh, Instagram or Facebook showing different uh, posts. Most of them or some of them were promoting different products 
from some influencers. Other posts were criticizing current um, questions in terms of immigration policies. And the last group was working on positive and negative propaganda in terms of smoking um, and the dangers of smoking or the maybe attraction of smoking here in this case. So uh, when it came to analyze the overall project, uh, we thought we'll do a SWOT analysis sort of a thing. So we'll identify strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats uh, of this program that we had. So the strengths was that uh, we created, uh, we were able to create a flexible media literacy lesson plan uh, in a hybrid teaching setup, which in itself is very new and very difficult. Uh, flexible because uh, we can change the artifacts to change the kind of conversations we want to have with students. Uh, so uh, that is all that brings in the flexibility. Uh, students were able to analyze pictures and understand the message. Uh, they were able to present the output in front of the class uh, and there was an intercultural competence. They were having a conversation with someone uh, with me, which was also a big experience for me as well to interact with students uh, from Germany. Uh, and uh, there were also aspects of them reflecting their media usage and uh, behavior. One thing we talked a lot about in the um, feedback session of this lesson was the difference between positive and negative propaganda. Maybe it was too obvious for the students. They tried to figure it out very quickly and were successful in general. Um, and one idea was to expand the student interaction in the next session to make the students talk to each other um, in more time. We presented, let the students present their work very quickly. So that would be one weakness um, in our review. And we thought it was quite difficult to estimate the learning of students, how easy they can detect messages in pictures and text. And that is one thing we thought about for our next project. And this leads me to the opportunities. Um, we thought about expanding our um, intercultural work in terms of history, for example, or culture between Germany and India in this case, and maybe as well to um, build certain digital communication technologies and to implement them in schools for special usage in uh, social media. All right. Oh. Uh, Ashkumar and Philip, thank you, thank you so much for taking our, uh, us into your classroom. And uh, I believe um, Zen and Maha are next. And um, Zen will uh, take us now into their um, transnational classroom, right? Hi, Zen. I believe you're still muted. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, I would, so is it in the slide deck there or do you want me to share my screen? Uh, it is in the slide deck actually. It would be uh, slide number 10 in our media logs right there. Zan, can you see my screen now that I'm sharing with your slide? I can, um, except I see all sorts of, yeah, other things. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm muted again? No, I'm not. No, okay. no, no, you're good. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I'm Zan um, and Walker Gonsalves, and I teach at a small university in New Hampshire in the US and very rural. And my partner who was unable to be here is Maha Bali, and she teaches at American University in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, we began this uh, project uh, last year, um, working together uh, at the uh, Summer Institute for Digital Learning. And we decided we would try to do a, uh, a semester long project as part of our two different courses. And uh, 
this is so so the background so i've given you a little bit of background there is really that we we began with a shared vision of really wanting our students to have more uh cross-cultural time and to develop uh, some empathy and humility and so we settled on using um in the fall we settled on using uh one zoom and also one hypothesis the social annotation tool uh and and what students found mostly from from the fall semester was they were surprised at how alike they were so they really saw mirrors in each other um and we wanted to see if we could break that mirror a little bit um and offer them a window into the differences um which are a little harder to get at sometimes especially for all of our students who are a traditional age college students um, who are more likely to see mirrors than look through windows at other, um, at other cultures and how those work. So this time what we did was we, uh, the, the hypothesis reading they did was uh, based on othering and what othering is. And uh, we had them reflecting on that and also um, in our Zoom, we did two Zoom sessions. And, and what we did there was to build their capacity to see the differences between themselves um, and uh, think together about what that meant when a cross-cultural team got together to uh, do some work and, um, and what was difficult about that. Um, and what was useful about it. So, um, so behind the scenes, we were also given a, um, a couple of other people to work with. Uh, and, you know, Maha and I are, are very fast. We're like a bullet train where we move very quickly. And so uh, we found it difficult to figure out how to integrate our two other partners. Otherwise we would have done that fabulous four thing <laughs> that we just saw. Um, but uh, we are hopeful to be able to learn more this summer um, at the Institute uh, about how to uh, better assess what the students' learning was around cultural humility in particular. And so it's, a, um, it's, it's evolving. And uh, what you see on this slide over here are um, the introduction slides and, uh, and the, the different Zoom slide decks that we had uh, and a little information about um, uh, the university in Cairo. So that's it. Yeah, well, thank you very much, um, Zen. Um, and I just wanted to mention it's really great that you mentioned uh, that you that you um, uh, gave us all the links in uh, in your in your poster in your slides, so um, we all can follow up on on your very rich project. Um, looking at our next slide, we have um, Pam and uh, Renee coming up to talk about their project. Floor is yours. Uh, Pam, are you on this call? I think you are, my friend. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, okay, so um, Pam and I worked this spring to develop a media literacy training program for instructors at the Austin, Texas Police Academy. We were asked to come in and help police instructors make better use of videos for learning. Pam brought her uh, lifetime of experience uh, in uh, working with cultural, um, cultural and community groups. Uh, and our project was designed to help instructors critically examine videos used in police training, including looking at how they might reinforce race and gender stereotypes and promote excessive use of force. So Renee, Bob and team. Renee, can I, can I jump in? Uh, we don't see you your slide. slide yet. Oh, you don't see my slides yet. Oh my goodness yeah. gracious. So sorry about that. Let me see if I can share <laughs> Would you screen. want me, would you like me for me to share the screen? Sure, oh, Iglita, would you do that? That would be yeah. so helpful. Thank you so much. Of course I will, just, yeah. You rock my friend. And I should be unmuted now too, Renee. Oh, good show, Pam. And let me then spotlight you. So Pam, uh, 
talk a little bit about what what did we learn from this project? This was quite a amazing experience designing it, implementing it, and now we're in the practice of assessing it. Uh, what did you learn? Well, we learned a ton, and I think we probably learned as much from the police uh, academy instructors as they learned from us about media literacy and how it can be woven into their instructional courses. Um, I was seriously taking notes during uh, the previous <laughs> uh, presentations here today because um, fear-bound thinking it might play into what we do and othering definitely, uh, you know, play, and I'm already thinking about uh, community and, and police uh, cross-cultural communication. So um, yeah, we just learned a whole lot about especially how these particular instructors are feeling very um, put upon because they have a community that is up in arms that did a, that passed a defunding proposal um, and and a huge uh, reimagining the academy that they were undergoing at the same time that they have an administration now that is very progressive and really wants to do all these things. So she, they're not feeling supported in many ways, these medium um, level guys on either end. And that was um, that I think so. I think our interactive um, uh, approach really worked. Do you want to talk more about that? Yeah, so we really uh, used the pedagogy of uh, 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 view and discuss, <laughs> right? We're in many different circumstances. We just set up opportunities for people to listen to each other, hear each other, and learn to respect the diverse interpretations that are even present within that homogeneous group of police officers. Um, for, for, me, for, for me, one of the things that I think is still I'm still struggling with is how do we disrupt that us versus them thinking, right? That uh, enables uh, um, uh, police instructors to appreciate multi-perspectival thinking. And one big insight, and Pam, you really gave this to me, is how many things that police officers and teachers have in common. And when we started this project, we thought, oh, this is a group we've never really we don't really know this group very well, but we ended realizing that actually they face many of the same challenges that elementary and secondary teachers do. Um, and we're excited to see where this project will lead us. Thank you so much, um, Renee and Pam. And with that being said, uh, we move on to uh, Inza, Kathy, and um, Francisca. However, before they start, um, they have requested um, one additional minute from us or two uh, because they want to um, play a little game with me uh, with us. So, uh, floor is yours. Thank you <clears throat> and hello to everyone. We want to play a quick, quick game. And um, so please take the pen and the paper you were asked to bring and get ready and listen carefully. So we're gonna do some sketching, but you've only got five seconds per task. So please, <laughs> please draw with the fewest lines possible. So the fastest and also the clearest you can. And in five seconds, a Mexican. Go. And stop. Now, please show your results to the camera and take a look at the other example. I made a bad ombre. <laughs> OK, you're ready for the next one. <clears throat> Please draw with the fewest lines possible, the fastest, but also the clearest you can, a disabled person. And stop, show us. <laughs> Love it. <clears throat> and the last task, again, the same, please draw a superhero.
and stop. Show your results and look at the other results. Nice. Thanks a lot. I'd now like to hand over to Francisca. Yes, thank you so much, Ensa, for playing this game with us. Let me just quickly share our slide. So we're Kathy, Ensa, and Francisca. And as you may have guessed from that game, we discussed how to draw and redraw stereotypes in the classroom. Our motto is not all heroes wear capes and the cape does not make the hero. That's because our common passions are stereotypes and how to break them up in the classroom, as well as using pop culture artifacts to support learning, which is perfect for our target group. What came out of this project is a lesson sequence for 13 to 14 year olds, which enables our learners to recognize, understand, actively engage with and deconstruct stereotypes in a framework that can be adapted to different teaching contexts and cultural backgrounds. So you could use that lesson sequence in Germany, in the US, in any country you could imagine with minimal adjustments and it works in a native language classroom as well as a foreign language classroom. Our approach for this combines visual learning, popular culture, as mentioned, and skill-based teaching with a personalized student portfolio to assess the learning processes and outcomes. We chose superhero comics because we find in them a lot of stereotypes as well as that being a medium that our learners are very familiar with. Um, whether it is the comics, whether it is the Marvel Avengers movies, for example, it is very present in their lives. And while we often discuss national stereotypes, for example, we rarely focus on that kind of medial representation. On the other hand, um, we have seen a growing number of non-stereotypical representations of superheroes, representations of minorities and intersectionality, which is immensely interesting to us. So we wanted to take the opportunity to confront our learners with these stereotypes. And the game you've just experienced is actually the introduction to this lesson sequence. So that's how we start. And then we ask learners to name stereotypes they know, to bring stereotypes and representations of stereotypes, for example, in the form of superhero comics to the classroom, to introduce their favorite superheroes, and then to think about these representations, to relate to them. What's the use of using stereotypes? What's the usefulness maybe behind that? How is that helpful and how is that harmful? And then following that, we guide them through steps of analyzing these stereotypes and the representations they've brought and also representations we as teachers provide towards enabling them to implement their own literal redrawing of the stereotypes in the form of a four panel comic strip. So that is the finished product that we ask our learners to produce as a group. And what we've made so far are the lesson plans and materials. Um, Kathy and I are very much looking forward to INSA actually trying out our lesson sequence at the Deutsches Gymnasium in Würzburg in a couple of weeks. Um, we're preparing to publish a project article, a poster, so working on that. And um, the MediaLux team has kindly agreed to publish the finished comic strips and possibly the student portfolios online on the MediaLux website. So thank you so much for enabling us to connect with each other. We would never have met if not for this format. And we were so happy with the cooperation. Thank you so much. And also thank you for taking care of the publication. Um, we are very excited about that. And also the students are so much looking forward to actually getting their comic strips published online and making them available to a wider audience. 
Well, thank you, uh, thank you um, Francisca Inza and Kathy, uh, for um, for uh, being um, such an um, uh, uh, active team and for uh, for sharing all these amazing insights into your project. Um, in the chat, I can also see um, that many people just loved your activity, and um, uh, yeah, I believe. Um, Oh, look who's next. Um, so um, yeah, Juan and me um, are next to present our, um, our project. And to begin with, it was really a very lucky coincidence that Juan and me could become partners in our media log project because initially we met as coach and coachee um, while the partnering process in the power of Two-Face was still very much in flux. Um, but during our first direct conversations, we found out that we're both very much interested um, in connecting intercultural and media related um, perspectives in our um, research and um, teaching practice. Um, our research fields and foci, however, um, differ. Um, Juan um, follows a sociocultural approach to information literacy in intercultural settings with the aim to support um, international student transitions um, um, to new uh, information environments. And I'm doing um, design-based research um, to support teacher educators, um, media-related intercultural competency, competency development using a virtual reality environment. Um, and when Juan and me got to know each other and started exchanging research literature, the, um, the sociocultural critique on established approaches to information literacy very much um, resonated with me, I have to say, because it basically said that if you establish national standards for information literacy, newcomers from other um, knowledge and information ecologies um, uh, might or even will be seen as inadequate or needing to assimilate. We can link this observation of bias to other intercultural research contexts, of course, um, but um, we're, but we can also um, uh, link our problem of practice that we discovered um, to propaganda education. For example, in a recent book, Rene distinguishes between indoctrination and education, arguing that the latter always needs a variety of perspectives and the possibility of critical engagement. And this is very much what um, the approach of action and development oriented media pedagogy um, uh, seeks to facilitate, just to name now um, for the shortage of time, two um, frameworks um, um, that um, um, Juan and me included to look at our problem of practice at this stage. Um, and to facilitate this sort of intercultural engagement um, uh, that came to mind, um, uh, social uh, VR um, came to mind as particularly suitable um, as a learning environment because through the sense of immersion and agency, among other things, learners can feel a very high sense of social um, presence, which then can uh, lead to powerful um, perspective sharing, empathy building processes. Um, our idea at this stage um, is therefore to collaborate on a learning opportunity, focusing on information literacy um, um, using a VR um, um, application, what we are still very much at the stage where we are exploring um, um, possibilities for us. But on the next slide, you could you can already see um, where this could lead us and um, effectively um, we want to end with uh, with a piece of uh, propaganda that we have created for you um, <laughs> a beneficial <laughs> propaganda because since logistics um, are very hard it was never actually possible for Juan and me to meet in virtual reality but this is um, what it could um, uh, look like and how um, how um, 
we in we envision our collaboration for uh, together. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't exceed the time too much. Wow. And we, have, <laughs> and we do have one more team um, uh, in the line, and that is Melanie and Fred. So floor is yours. Okay. Um, so. <clears throat> Our project essentially was we were trying to create a list of sorts of international news um, outlets, be they broadcast and print. That's pretty much what we focused on the most. Um, and to try to gather as many sort of international points of view as we could, <clears throat> prioritizing things like um, if it was kid friendly, like could we find kid friendly um channels or alternatives for some of these outlets as well, because uh, Melanie is preparing to be a teacher of much younger children and I teach at the high school level, so teenagers. So we had a real variety of sort of target audiences as we were trying to put this together. And then also we were really trying to be cognizant of how we were gathering up the sources and what that sort of looked like for us uh, as a way to model it for students to do it themselves as well. Um, I don't know, Melanie, would you, would you like to jump in at any point? Yeah, here? of course. Uh, I mean, the most difficult part of our project was for sure to find newspapers or news brokers that would also try to reach out to children and younger kids. Yeah, that definitely was a challenge um, as well as I would say one other thing that I think we sort of learned um, and we talked about um, sort of together was how we deal with outlets that probably would qualify as more propaganda than news centric. And we included them in our list because they did provide a perspective. Um, how we would address that, I think is like sort of an open question still, um, but we decided to include them and not shy away from them. Um, we also had to prioritize slightly um, English speaking outlets and we sort of had a, a more, a little longer conversation about that more recently, um, in part because uh, English is pervasive around the world, but it also has some sort of cultural colonial vestiges and um, because we were picking more internationally focused sources, um, they tended to come in a version of English, although we can also sort of rely on some translation um, aspects as well. Did we include TikTok channels? No, we did not. No, no. <laughs> we stuck with primarily um, the more sort of tried and true larger media outlets that had an international presence. And that brings us to the end of our three minutes. <laughs> 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 three minutes sharp. Um, that was that was quite amazing. Thank you so much, um, Fred and uh, Melanie. Um, uh, let me now. Um, so after we've we've heard um, eight teams um, uh, projects, uh, which is quite amazing. But let me ask um, the others. Um, um, is there, does anybody wish to share um, uh, or briefly talk about um, their? Um, process um, anybody who might not have been able to um, to share um, their slide then just raise your hand make yourself heard yeah Lauren go ahead so so I, I must have missed the memo about the slides but but Johnny and Colleen and I have been working on a multi-quarter project where we're going to replicate um, an idea that we got from one of Renee's books about critiquing the creators uh, from the Ordinary Creativity Project where we are going to ask, we both teach at colleges of education in the US and we were, were gonna, I'm running a pilot this spring where I'm gonna ask my uh, pre-service teachers to take one of their favorite uh, social media creators 
and really critique them by asking some of the five critical questions, you know, who's, who's uh, represented here, who's not, which lifestyles are represented, which aren't, to really get them to more closely read uh, what they're looking at anyway, you know, throughout their day, just to become a little bit more aware uh, of that. And uh, Johnny, I'll pass it to you to talk about uh, the research project part of it. Yeah, because we're both teacher educators, we're excited about exploring this with our pre-service teachers in our two different settings. And uh, so this fall, I will be doing this assignment, this research with English pre-service teachers. So their language arts uh, in the high school and middle school in my area in the uh, Utah in the United States. And we uh, wanted to explore all those data and then publish it in a in the JMLE, Journal of Media Literacy Education. And it just so happened that during this, in, right in the middle of this work, our um, National Council of Teachers of English, spearheaded by Renee and a group of others, um, put out or, or shared a statement about media literacy. And so I think we're going to try to use some of the things there, like how do we, with our students, explore representation and power through critical reading, li listening and viewing. How do we give students a chance to share their voice with writing, speaking, and self-expression? So we're going to, each of us, do this kind of a study in our two settings and then see what the students come up with. How are they critiquing these influencers, maybe in English teaching, like, you know, English teaching influencers, or just more generally? And we're excited to see how this pans out, and we're grateful that um, you put us together, because, again, I wouldn't have met I don't think I would have met Lauren. I would have missed out on this golden nugget. Wow. Wow. Let's give a round of applause to everyone who participated in the showcase. Wasn't it amazing? Congratulations to absolutely everybody. Now we have some reflection questions and only a few minutes to address them, but um, there they are. We'd love to hear from you briefly. Um, looking back on the program, what did you like about it? What was challenging? What did you learn? How was this form of professional development relevant to your work? How could the program be improved? Raise your hand or unmute your microphone. Let's do five minutes of reflection as we think back about your learning, your learning and your participation in the Media Logs uh, project. What do you wanna remember? What was valuable to you? What'd you get out of this experience? How would you describe it to someone who hadn't participated in it? I'm on a me. On a me. Oh, I would love to answer to that question because uh, I love interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary projects. But in fact, it was the first time in my life to participate in such a way in a project like that uh, and to, to, to experience the benefits from um, communication discussions with people so, so experienced, so open-minded like Bob Randall and Yanis to learn so much from every discussion. I appreciate the opportunity to do it synchronously because it's different. Of course, we have our repository in uh, Google Drive. So we learn, I think, a lot about how to organize activities like that. It was beneficial on every level and very, very exciting too. So I would strongly recommend and I, I endorse this format. I hope that there will be a sequel and a franchise of Media Logs. So I loved everything. Thank you for sharing. Who's next? Reflecting on this project, what do you want to remember? I can talk about it a, a little bit. I think uh, from, it's a really a very wonderful platform where researchers can get together and uh, match with each other. The expertise brought by researcher uh, can really become something really exciting. As I never think about using VR to teach information literacy. And, uh, and also I think I feel the beauty of research that the ideas come together and uh, ideas draw from different theories, different research background. 
and I really hope this kind of platform will will be long lasting. It will benefit researchers. And thank you for creating such an opportunity and platform. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Now I'd like to hear from uh, the the team of Media Logs, um, our team, um, because you also had a learning experience. What do you want to remember about this initiative? What did you learn? What was important or surprising or worthwhile to you? Troy? Number one, time zones matter. <laughs> we were trying to figure all that out for months as to when and how and why we would schedule these events. And then we even got messed up when daylight savings time uh, happened again for one of our planning meetings. But above and beyond that, I think that relationships matter and the sustained dialogue and conversation and the back and forth and the the ways in which we're able to um, build meaning through an analysis of media and to share concerns and questions that we have in the United States with our colleagues in Germany, similar patterns, unfortunately, um, continue to happen through history and even in modern, modern political times. So we, we share a lot of the same concerns and we're able to share teaching strategies as well. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of the team. Thank you so much, Silka. What did you get out of this experience? Um, I learned a lot about how powerful it can be to develop a project in an international and interdisciplinary team. And um, being a member of such a motivated international professional media logs learning community was for me an exceptional experience. And it inspires me to create more cross-cultural activities with different groups in the future. And so hopefully we all can strengthen media literacy locally, nationally and internationally, and hopefully contribute to develop or keep democratic and peaceful societies. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Giannis and Christina, tell us just briefly about your learning experience and what you'll want to remember from this adventure. Oh, I think I'm taking away a lot of excitement um, about all the various projects um, that have found their starting point here, right? So I think they will be powerful for sure. And I think the collaboration of people was very important, like people coming from all over the world. And that's an effective and energetic way to tackle contemporary propaganda and disinformation and to foster critical thinking. Um, yeah, and I, I was I was often thinking that um, as an um, as an um, intercultural trainer, what I've did so far very much felt like a um, bit secluded as an add-on behind closed doors. But um, here in the Media Logs project, um, we heard about the two very fast-moving trains already. Like I could really sense um, that it's not an add-on, but really something very integrated into very diverse. Uh, professional contexts and um, that can mean a lot of improvisation um, but that's what made it really um, fascinating for me so um, thanks a lot uh, to everybody for uh, for uh, being on this adventure yeah and so for me the big takeaway is the boundless creativity of teachers and you demonstrated that for us today, and we are so grateful for it. Uh, whenever you think that the institutions we work with are broken and can't be fixed, just turn to look at the creativity of teachers and get re-inspired about the possibilities. Now, guess what? We end with a little prize. We're able to offer four free tuitions to the Summer Institute in Digital Literacy to four lucky participants who are in the call today. Troy is going to pick the winners and watch how we're gonna do it, you guys. Yeah, so I just wanna share a fun little tool. A uh, lot of different classroom interactives you can use here. Um, we're going to use the one called the Random Name Picker. So I just dropped the link to Flippity in the chat. But what I've been doing as we've been participating today is uh, just gathered everyone's name right here and we are going to generate a random name picker. So whoever shows up first, I'm, I'm still going to spin the wheel here, so I apologize. Oh, it's neutral. There we go. All right. So we're going to spin four times. Um, if your name is chosen, we probably have your email address, but it would be worth dropping your email address in the chat just so Renee has it for sure and she can register you. So Juan is our first winner for a virtual registration to the Summer Institute. 
Our second winner will be Randall. So you have a winning ticket for the Virtual Summer Institute. Our third winner will be Melanie. So again, if uh, you have not shared your email with Renee, you probably have, but it might be worth just dropping in the chat so she has it. And then Ashkumar, thank you. You are our fourth winner for the Virtual Summer Institute. And if for some reason you're not able to use that uh, registration, please let us know and we will try to figure out a way to pass the, pay it forward and pass it on to someone else who might be able to. So thank you. Wow, that was awesome. You guys, we would love to publish the projects and activities that you do as part of this project on the Media Logs website so that it becomes a resource that you can uh, point to with pride. So you just send those to me and I'll put them up on the website. I wanna thank Silka and Troy and Bakir and Christina and Giannis for being part of this grand invention. But most of all, I wanna thank you for trusting uh, to spend your time with us. Over the last eight months, we learned together and we played together and we laughed together and we reflected together. Thanks for being part of the Media Logs project and thanks to the uh, US Embassy in Berlin for sponsoring us today. Bye everybody.